Hello, everybody. I've got a video here for you where I go through a presentation. I'm going to share my screen. This is about chapter four. What you should do, what I expect, that kind of thing. If you watch this, hopefully we have at least a little bit less back and forth than usual than we sometimes do. Okay, the point of chapter four is to tell the story of your data. So I'll start out by talking a little bit about the purpose, what I mean by telling the story of your data. We'll go through the guidelines that are in the dissertation guidelines with slight modifications from me. Then I'll talk about qualitative chapter fours and quantitative chapter fours to finish up. And I am trying to enunciate, to be understood very well. Okay, so the purpose, as I said, you got to tell the story of your data. Chapter four should provide the data and evidence that answers your research questions. Okay, so um, what to answer a research question when you're thinking about what data to include in your fourth chapter, you can't include it all. And so what you have to do is select the data that is representative of all the data and put that forth in a way that can help you answer your research questions. All right, let's go through these guidelines. Okay, start off with some general, general advice here. This chapter presents the major findings in a manner appropriate to a given study. That means your study determines what's in chapter four. But I can say this universally, do not dump your data into a Word document and send it to me, calling it a draft of chapter four. I will read it for just long enough to send it back to you and say, this is not a chapter four draft. This is your raw data. Okay, so what you have to do is course, analyze the data and your, what happens with your analysis and what you find through analysis is what you should have in chapter four. You have to synthesize the data. It's just like the literature review you did. You didn't list all the articles and give a summary of each article in your review of literature. You had to put it all together and organize it. Well, the same thing happens in chapter four, okay? That's the story that you tell. You set it up in such a way to make an argument. The arguments have to be well-formed, insightful, and they have to be grounded in the study. There has to be data to support the arguments. Okay, the findings should be stated in a manner that lead to the conclusions and implications and recommendations of chapter five. Start out chapter four with an introduction, just as you start all the chapters, you can give a brief description of the areas that you will cover in the chapter, how it will be organized, and so on. Be sure to relate it to the methodology. That should be true throughout this chapter. There should be no surprises. All of it should be related to what you said you were going to do in your proposal. Start off with descriptive characteristics of participants. Give detailed descriptions of the pertinent information regarding the participants relevant to the study. The details of the setting or the context should not allow the identification for IRB purposes. We don't want, we want to keep things. You see here on the upper right, data presentation and results. You need to provide a description of how the analysis of the raw data from all the sources answer the research questions. I prefer you organize the data like this. You first give a general overview of things you learn from each source. Provide the results you analyze from the raw data, not the raw data itself. There should be tables, charts, and maybe other visuals. And of course, everything has to adhere to APA format. The results should be organized based on your analysis. What story did the data tell you? Here's what. D over here doesn't say. D does not say organize your data in relation to your research questions. 
to me, if you were to organize it based on your research questions, that would be too selective of a way to present the answers to your research questions. It'd be as if you went fishing for a certain fish and you caught it and you brought it back and you showed it to me. It would be less credible. Um, that was a terrible metaphor that I just used. Anyway, um, if you went fishing for a fish, however, the better metaphor is cherry picking. And if you have a question, you organize your results based on that question, it makes me think that you didn't pay any attention to your data and what it might tell you. Rather, you focus strictly on what you were looking for. And that is self-fulfilling. All right. E, summary of the results should focus on the research questions. Okay. That's where you get into the research questions. So D, you would say, here are the themes that came from all the data. And then, only then, do you say, now, here's how the themes answer my research questions, okay? You synthesize all your findings and answer them as best you can. If you're doing qualitative research, then part E is where you talk about triangulation. All right, next thing. Next paragraph, additional relevant documents important for your study can be placed in appendices. Get my approval. Don't place anything in the appendices that would compromise your anonymity. The summary, at the end of the chapter, will give a brief synopsis of the main points of the findings as related to the research questions, tell clearly what the answers are to the questions, and transition to chapter five. Now for some specific details for qualitative researchers. Your specific approach will determine in large part what your fourth chapter will look like. It's best to find a good study using your approach, whatever it was, and model it. A case study might have detailed descriptions of the cases. Some of you did multi-case studies, for example. You would arrange by case. If you wanted to, if it was relevant, you could arrange by chronology. But sometimes time is not important with a case study. You're just looking at a particular student, a particular principal, whatever. Okay. Case studies can be organized by theme as well. Ethnographies will have lots of thick descriptions. In fact, the thick descriptions should probably constitute the bulk of your results in chapter four. Okay, you can arrange those thick descriptions by chronology, again, if time is a very relevant factor in your data or theme or perhaps a cultural feature. If you're studying a subculture of students, perhaps there are certain things that those students all have in common. Those would be the things that help you organize your chapter. With grounded theory, you will organize based on themes, with evidence of the basis for the themes and the theory. I say in that order, that is, you want to say, here's what the data showed me. These are the themes that came out of coding. And then here's the theory that it relates to, that, or it's the theory that I can build based on that, okay? With phenomenology, you can organize by themes or essences or aspects of the thematic structure, starting with the ground and then figural aspects that emerge from that ground. With narrative, you will have stories and narratives as your results. Those will be your results. They'll be analyzed based on the type of narrative methodology you use, whether it be structural, narrative methodology or content narrative methodology structural, you would pick apart the elements of the stories that your participants told. And you would talk about those in the order that they tend to occur. If you focus strictly on the content of the stories, then you'd probably be looking at a chronological time-based story. This is how things started in store, the stories. Um, if you were talking about teachers who uh, told stories to you about their career path, 
you were focused on content, you would organize chronologically. Here's how they started. Here's where they were at mid-career. Here's where they were at end of career, maybe. Even though it's qualitative research, I expect to see charts and figures to help me and future readers understand the story of your data. You must follow up on all the procedures you talked about in chapter three, like your trustworthiness techniques. Do not say you did member checks in chapter three and not mention them at all in chapter four. You might only mention them once. That would be fine. You must talk about triangulation. Dr. Taylor requires that you have more, at least three rather, sources of data that are different. You must speak to how they overlapped, contradicted each other, that kind of thing. Coding must be presented within a visual. If you don't like it, if you don't like a coding visual, there's an example on Dr. Taylor's website, wiserunning.com. If you don't like that, then you can put it in an appendix, but it must appear in the dissertation somewhere. I think a coding visual is a pretty handy thing to put in there to help the reader really see how you went from the raw data to the major themes. That's all I got for qualitative dissertations. For quantitative dissertations, I don't have much. You will need tables and figures. The more ways you can portray your results visually, the better, but don't overdo it. Include careful explanations of what the data say. Notice data is plural. They say the data. There's an example over here to the right that I'm gonna talk about in just a second about regression analysis. Again, with chapter four, if you're quantitative, you must follow up on what you have in chapter three. Do not leave readers hanging. Now, to get to this example, the point of this example is to show you that no matter how complicated the statistical technique you use, you must explain it in terms that all the people who could possibly benefit from your research will understand, okay? This is top level, I've never seen as good an explanation as this for a regression analysis, okay? We use a technique called regression analysis to predict the likelihood that a teacher is, let's see, that a teacher leaves his or her school with teacher and school characteristics. This analysis shows for comparison of otherwise similar black and white teachers. For example, it allows us to compare turnover among black and white teachers working in schools of similar size, demographics, and achievement levels. If we compare teachers in similar schools and find that the turnover gap between black and white teachers is smaller than when we simply compare the turnover rate among black and white teachers in general, we can conclude that differences in where black and white teachers work explain some of the black-white turnover difference. This is a rare thing to see in research, and I want to see it in yours. That's all I got. Good luck. Let me know if you have questions.